I'd like to thank all participants for holding. All lines will be on listen only until the question and answer portion of today's conference. I'd also like to inform participants today's call is being recorded. I'd now like to turn the call over to Irene Ihear. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. I am Irene Ihear of CDR Agent's Office of Communication and Education. Today, we will be discussing the guidance document, Custom Device Exemption, which published on September 24th. The guidance is intended to clarify exemptions for custom device manufacturers by defining terms and explaining requirements. Today, you will hear from two presenters, Aaron Keith, Director of the Division of Anesthesia, General Hospital Respiratory, Infection Control, and Dental Devices, and CDRH's Office of Device Evaluation, and Leslie Castor, Consumer Safety Officer in the Division of Pre-Market Labeling Compliance and CDRH's Office of Compliance. Aaron and Leslie will present an overview of the guidance document, and then we'll open the line to take your questions. Following today's webinar, the slide presentation, audio recording, and written transcript of today's pro program will be available on the CDRH Learn section of the FDA website. Now, I give you Aaron. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for participating in today's webinar where we're going to discuss the custom device exemption guidance document. Um, today's webinar is going to be divided into the two main topics covered in the custom device exemption guidance document. Those are some policy, the policy related to custom device exemption and the annual report requirements. I'm going to present the information on the policy portion of the webinar, and Leslie Castro will be presenting the information on the annual report requirements. The main purpose of my presentation is to orient you to what is contained in the policy section of the guidance document. But before we get to the guidance document itself, I want to describe a little history of the custom device exemption itself and the current version of the exemption. The original version of the exemption was contained in the 1976 medical device amendments. It was a very narrow exemption from pre-market requirements um, where a series of conditions were required to be met in order for a device to be considered a custom device. The interpretation of that particular provision was it was a one-off for a single new device, not a customization of an existing device. Um, you'll note on your slide that there's an error in relationship to the today to date. It should be uh, July 2012, not July 2014. In July of 2012, um, the, the Food and Drug Act was amended under the Sedasia Act where the custom device exemption was expanded. While it is still narrow and a series of conditions must be, re must be met, it was expanded from its extremely narrow one-off um, from the original. It also added a new requirement for industry related to annual reports. For those of you who have not seen the current version of the custom device exemption, I wanted to walk you through the clauses and the subclauses for the current version of the law. The current version of the law requires that all of the all of the parts A through G of B1 and all of the parts A through C of B2 of 520B are met in order for a device to be considered a valid custom device. Um, the provision states that in general, the requirements for Section 514 and 515 shall not apply to a device that is created or modified in order to comply with the order of an individual physician or dentist in order to comply with an order prescribed in paragraph A, necessarily deviates from otherwise applicable performance standards under section 514 or the requirements under section 515. It is not generally available in the United States in finished form through labeling or advertising by the manufacturer, importer, or distributor for commercial distribution. It is designed to treat unique pathology or physiological conditions that no other device is domestically available to treat. It is intended either to meet the special needs of such a physician or dentist in the course of his or her professional practice, 
or is intended for use by an individual named in such order of such a physician or dentist. It can be assembled from components or manufactured and finished on a case-by-case basis to accommodate the unique needs of the individuals described in, in the clause 1 and 2 of the paragraph E. It may have common standardized design characteristics, chemical and material compositions, and manufacturing processes as commercially distributed devices. I just want to note um, two, two things that Clause, um, subclause E1 and E2 describe two potential options for the custom device. One is physician-focused or physician-centric, and the other is patient-focused or, or patient-centric. And then additionally, clauses F and G um, expand or broaden the devices that can qualify as a custom device by allowing for um, changes in similarities in manufacturing. In, in addition, a custom device has to also meet the limitations described in 5, in 20B2, um, parts A through B. This is, states that paragraph 1 shall apply to a device only if such device is for the purpose of treating a sufficiently rare condition such that conducting clinical investigations on such a device would be impractical. Production of such a device under paragraph 1 is limited to no more than five units per year of a particular device type, provided that such replication otherwise complies with this section. And finally, the manufacturer of such device notifies the agency on an annual basis of the manufacturer of such devices. There are some really important changes under the Sedasia version of the custom device exemption that I want to highlight. Um, the first being that both new and modified existing devices have the potential to qualify for the custom device exemption. There is the potential for multiple units of a device type in, a, in one year, no more than five per year. There is also an additional annual report reporting requirement for the manufacturer, and Congress had, um, told us to issue a guidance document addressing how we would deal with the um, replication of units of no more than five, in other words, how we would count to five. So the guidance document, as I stated before, is, is divided into two, two primary sections. One covers policy and the other covers, covers the annual report. In the policy section, we provide definitions that are important for the implementation of the custom device exemption, explain how we propose, how we are going to count to five for the replication of up to five, of not to include, <laughs> of five units a year. And um, we also address some common custom device exemption questions that the agency has received over the years. The annual report section addresses the general content and the logistics of submission and provides specific information to submit for the patient-centric custom device and specific information for the physician-centric custom device. In the policy section. There are three uh, there are three main portions of the policy section. Um, the first one deals with key definitions. These definition the definition section addresses key terms important to implementing the custom device exemption. Wherever possible, the terms are based on existing CDR de definitions or are linked to the language in the law. Some of the I've listed some of the key definitions in this slide. However, as an example. Um, in the guidance document, device type is defined as a generic device. A generic device type is defined as a grouping of devices that do not differ significantly in purpose, design, materials, energy source, function, or any other feature related to safety and effectiveness 
for which similar regulatory controls are sufficient to provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. This definition comes from 21 CFR Part 860.3i. Some of the other key definitions that are included in the document are necessarily deviates, not generally available, special needs, sufficiently rare condition, unique pathology, unique physiological condition. The next portion of the policy section of the guidance document addresses the replication of five units a year. Um, the law limits to no more than five units of a device type per year, and it directed FDA to issue this, this specific guidance document. FDA interprets five units in terms of five new custom de devices per year in five new patients for a patient-focused device or five new physicians for a physician-focused device, assuming that all other requir required elements for the custom device exemption are satisfied. The five-unit limitation includes all devices of a device type provided, to, uh, provided by a manufacturer to and remaining in the possession of the ordering physician or the patient. However, we are, the guidance document allows for, count, allows for sizing. FDA does not intend to include in the tally of five units per year any extra units produced for a unique case because of sizing concerns, so long as the ordering physician has either destroyed those devices not used for that case or they have returned them to the manufacturer and, and the devices are not redistributed without a valid U.S. marketing authorization or a subsequent valid custom device case. The, the final portion of the policy section deals with common custom device exemption questions that we have received over the years. For example, the first question in the guidance document is from states, from which pre-market and post-market requirements is my custom device exempt? And the answer contained in the guidance document reads, under Section 520B of the FDNC Act, custom devices are exempt from pre-market approval requirements and conformance to mandatory performance standards. Custom devices are not exempt from any other regulations, including but not limited to the quality system regulation, including design controls, medical device reporting, labeling, corrections and removal, and registration and listing. I've listed some of the some of the questions that you will find in the guidance document. This is not an exhaustive list, but some of the other questions include, can a device be subject to an IDE, be a custom device? Can a custom device be both a physician-centric and a patient-centric device? Can modifications to a 510K device qualify as a custom device? How are revisions and servicing of existing custom devices included in the limit of no more than five of the device type per year? How to label a custom device and examples of what is and what is not a valid custom device? At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Leslie, and she will discuss the annual report section of the guidance document. Good afternoon. As Erin said, I'm going to discuss the annual report section. Due to the statutory amendments in FDA to the custom device exemption, manufacturers are now required to submit annual reports. The manufacturer of a custom device must report to FDA annually on the custom devices it has supplied. The annual report should cover an entire calendar year and be submitted to FDA within the first quarter of the following calendar year, no later than March 31st. This first year's reports are due on March 31st, 2015, and should cover the period from July 9th, 2012, when FDASIA was enacted, through December 31st, 2014. Information that should be included in the annual report is the number of all custom devices distributed, an account for custom devices that were returned or destroyed, and the number of patients who received the device or revisions of a previous custom device. If multiple custom devices were used in one patient, each custom device used must be accounted for in the annual report. 
A cover letter should accompany the annual report and contain the following. A reference line that states custom device annual report, contact information, the number of custom devices manufactured and distributed, and the reporting period. The annual report must also contain a truthful and accurate statement. We recommend you use the language provided here on this slide. This language is also provided in the appendix in appendix two of the guidance. As Aaron mentioned earlier, custom devices are either patient-centric or physician-centric. The next two slides will address patient-centric custom devices and the justification required for how or why the device manufactured to treat an individual patient meets the following conditions contained in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Please refer to the guidance document for this information with respect to physician-centric custom devices. For Sections 520B1B and 520B2A, explain why the device necessarily deviates from the pre-market requirements, including treating a sufficiently rare condition such that conducting clinical investigations are impractical. You may include information on the incidence or prevalence of the condition or disease the device is intended to diagnose, treat, mitigate, or prevent. In addition, you should include an explanation of why conducting clinical investigations on such a device would be impractical. For Section 520B1A, indicate whether the device is a newly created device or modified from an existing legally marketed device in order to comply with the order of an individual physician. For Section 520B1C, attest that the device is not generally available in the United States in finished form through labeling or advertising by the manufacturer, importer, or distributor for commercial distribution. For Sections 520B1D and 520B2B, provide a complete description of the device, including device type, for example, the product code, and the patient's unique pathology or physiological conditions the device was designed to treat. To show that Section 520B1D is met, provide a statement that no other device is domestically available to treat the patient's unique pathology or physiological condition. You should maintain records of the evaluation that you use to determine that no other device is domestically available to treat the patient's unique pathology or physiological condition. For Section 520B1E2, provide a unique patient identifier for the individual patient in the physician's order. For Section 520B1F, state whether the device is assembled from components or manufactured and finished on a case-by-case -case basis to accommodate the unique needs of individuals. In addition, for Section 520B1G, explain whether the device or device components have common standardized design characteristics, chemical and material compositions, and the same manufacturing processes as commercially distributed devices. When submitting annual reports to FDA, custom device manufacturers submit, should submit two copies of the annual report, including at least one hard copy, to the address contained in the guidance document. For those of you who may have printed the document prior to last week, please note that the room number for the annual report submission has changed and is now room 2622, but the rest of the address is correct. Although it is not required, it is strongly encouraged that one of the two copies be submitted as an e-copy, for example, a PDF file on a CD, DVD, or flash drive. For more information about submitting an e-copy, please refer to the guidance document titled e-copy program for medical device submissions, guidance for industry and food and drug administration staff. The link for this document is provided in the custom device exemption, exemption guidance document also. How will FDA use the information we obtain from annual reports? Well, first off, the information will help FDA understand how industry is interpreting and applying the custom device exemption and can shed light on areas that may need further clarification. Annual reports will also allow FDA to ensure, to ensure compliance with the custom device exemption. Primarily, it will allow us to know if industry is manufacturing and distributing only the permitted number of custom devices per device type per year as defined in FDASIA and explained in the guidance. In addition, FDA will use the information to track the number and type of custom devices to respond to inquiries from stakeholders such as Congress. 
What if FDA determines that a device distributed did not meet the requirements of the exemption? The FDA's primary focus is helping manufacturers implement the custom device exemption correctly and efficiently. The FDA intends to notify a manufacturer in writing about the reasons the devices are not eligible for the exemption. The FDA will consider taking enforcement actions when the situation calls for it. But if, upon our review of the annual report, we determine that a company manufactured and distributed devices not eligible for this provision, for this provision, we do not generally intend to use enforcement actions to inform the company. Rather, the FDA intends to notify the company in writing about the reasons that the devices were not eligible for the exemption with the expectation that such clarifications will prevent future incorrect application of the exemption. The FDA may consider enforcement action for a company that manufactures and distributes devices under this provision that are clearly not eligible or have been previously notified by the FDA that they are not eligible. And that concludes my portion. We'd like to open the line up for questions. Okay, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, press star one. Please record your name when prompted. Once again, that's star one to ask a question. One moment for our first question. Lauren Camer, your line is open. Uh, hello. Uh, in terms of the custom device exemption, um, the guidance clarifies that custom devices are not exempt from registration and listing requirements. However, when I've gone into FURLS to take a look at how that would occur, if you enter a pro code that says a class 2 device, it automatically yells at me if I don't supply it with a 510K number. So I'm just wondering logistically, how do we go about listing custom devices in FURLS? Hello, this is Eric Korowitz, um, and currently the uh, quality system uh, working group that we just have uh, had a lot of um, input on the custom device guidance. Um, so the question you're asking is a good question. Um, the logistics of how it's how custom devices should be registered and listed are a better question for um, the registration and listing staff. Um, they should be able to uh, direct you about how to go about registering and listing custom devices. But it shouldn't, there should be good ways of doing that. It shouldn't end up being a burden. We certainly will. If there are changes that need to be made in order to to facilitate the process, then we may have to work with the registration and listing staff to ensure that that's true. Hi, this is this is Aaron Keith. The the, uh, the point that I would I would make about that is that um, it is possible we we do. Um, we do have pro codes for devices that do not have clearances that correlate to devices that do have clearances that relate to devices that are manufactured for export only. So my supposition is that such you would be using um, those product codes versus the product codes that would go through either the 510K or, or, or any of the pre-market programs. Our next question is from Julie. Your line is open. Once again, Julie, your line is open. Okay, we'll move on. Patricia, your line is open. Yes, my name is Patricia Derry. I have a newly uh, approved patent uh, for a device, Brain Paths. I got an email to um, attend this conference, telephone conference, 
I'm not sure if my device qualifies. I need to find, talk to somebody about that. Who would I talk to? Um, so you would, this is this is Aaron Keith, you would want to talk to the Office of Compliance, Leslie's division, so Leslie can give you a contact. Leslie. Yes, you can um, contact the custom device exemption mailbox. Uh, the email address is custom device. Custom devices at fda.hhs.gov. For any questions, you can just submit it to that mailbox, and we'll get back to you. Um, is custom device? Could you custom devices with an S. Okay. At fda.hhs.gov. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll take our next question. Uh, Kim is a Gary. Your line is open. I have a question about owner operator numbers versus registration numbers for a device. I have the uh, factory that has an owner operator number but not a registration number yet. Can I bring the product in to the U.S. without his registration number? And how do I add him to my importer's registration without his registration number? I think that would be a question um, better asked of the registration and listing staff. Uh, I, I don't think your question is necessarily specific to custom devices. Uh, it, the, the requirements for registration and listing shouldn't be any different for a custom device versus any other device. Okay, so I'll, I'll contact them because I have a device that we're bringing in, but the factories haven't received their registration numbers yet, just their owner-operator numbers. And I was wondering if I could, when they bring them in, if I just submit owner-operator number, if that's enough information to bring them into the U.S. Again, I would I would contact the registration and listing staff. They should be able to answer your question. So, and the, um, the registration and listing staff can be reached at R E G L I S T at D D R H dot F D A dot G O V. Um, they have a help desk phone number that is three zero one seven nine six seven four zero zero. Thank you. Okay, next question from Stephanie. Your line is open. Hi, I have a question about when the first annual report is due. Because when I read the guidance document, there was a statement in there that SBA will not enforce the annual reporting requirement until the end of the calendar year following the publication of the final guidance. And I interpreted that to mean it wasn't going to be enforced until the end of 2015. But it sounds like you're saying you want the first one in March of 2015. Um, could you could you repeat that? You broke up quite a bit on our end, and we didn't quite catch your whole question. I was wondering about when the first annual report is due, and there's a statement in the guidance document itself that says FDA will not enforce the annual reporting requirement until the end of the calendar year following publication of the final guidance. Right, so this is Leslie Haster. The first annual report is going to be due the first quarter of the calendar year, so between January and March 31st. So you're, you want it in March of 2015 because I interpreted this as the year following. It. Right, yes, 2015. I interpreted that as it wouldn't be enforced until the end of 2015 and therefore not due until 2016. So that is not what was intended by the No. Okay. No. Um, the guidance went final this year in September. Right. So 
it was the end of this year, 2014. So therefore, the reports are due the first quarter. Year in which the publication of the final guidance occurred, not the right. year following the publication. Right. And yeah. To be clear, the language in the guidance isn't intended to refer to the following year. It's okay. intending to refer to following the issuance of the guidance. Okay. That's good. I just didn't know that. Okay. Next question from Linda. Your line is open. Hi. The guidance document states that um, there is a, a tracking requirement. So you talked about different sizes of devices that may have been shipped out. Um, you know, how will the FDA be handling these as we're going back a few years? Um, this information may not be available in every circumstance about the return of the product. So how will FDA be um, handling that when you receive the annual report? Um, so I would say that our expectation would be for you to make your best effort to provide all the information in the first report that um, we're asking for, but we realize that it's coming out in September and it's six months basically until it's due. Um, so I make your best effort to provide all the information and then plan to move forward for the next year to have a more complete set of information. Okay, thank you. Before we take our next question, once again, star one to ask a question, and you must record your name when prompted. And our uh, next question is from Ian. Your line is open. Uh, hello. Um, my question relates to uh, precision-centric uh, custom instruments. I'm, I'm curious as to whether that would apply to instruments that uh, are modified versions of existing devices, perhaps uh, for a surgeon to attempt a, a different approach. So the physician-centric device is intended to address a physician's specific need in his or her practice associated with um, an, an anatomical need associated to, in order to practice medicine and use that particular device. Um, it's not related to a specific um, changing of surgical technique and approach. The physician-centric um, device has been hard for us to provide good examples because no one has ever actually provided us this one um, on, on how they saw uh, implementing that particular part of the, of the exemption. But, but the first part of your question, but yes, modifications to existing devices is potentially possible under the custom device exemption. Um, even for the physician centric, if it meets all of the other requirements of the of the exemption. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Our next question comes from Cheryl Zomer. Your line is open. Hi, this is Cheryl Zomer. I was just wondering if you could repeat the email address for help with registration and listing. Um, yes, just give us a minute to get that again. Okay, that would be the email address is R-E-G-L-I-S-T at C-D-R-H dot F-D-A dot gov and their phone number is 301-796-7400. Great. Thank you. Next question from Bradley. Your line is open. I have two questions regarding device type and the limit of five. Um, in the guidance, it says that knee replacement device systems compromise multiple device types. Uh, I'm assuming this would be such as a thermal component or a tibial component. Um, does the guidance allow for up to or no more than five units of a 
femoral component and separately five of a tibial component? Hi, um, this is Aaron Keith, and um, the portion of the guidance document isn't referring to the components that make up a device type. It's referring to the, the 23 and 24 product codes we have that defined that many different device types that are new replacement systems. So it's not going down to the component level. It's going down to the device type level. So, so for case, example, a uni like a for I w the difference between a uni on poly knee, a uni on um, a metal on metal uni knee, a the uh, um, metal on poly um, total knee, a constrained knee versus a semi-constrained knee. Those are the ways that we categorize different device types with different characteristics for knee systems but not at the component level in terms of a Correct. patient only needed the tibia component or only needed a femoral component, those would Correct. still just be considered a knee component. Correct. Okay. And then the second question had to deal with the um, disease states. It says, um, again, along the same lines, could be used in different disease states, can constitute different device types of knee systems. So. Does this mean that if there was provided all the other um, requirements for a custom device were met, that if this particular disease state, there were two particular disease states that each constituted, uh, you know, sufficiently rare conditions, that you could do five to treat one disease state and five to treat a different disease state of both being a knee component? Yes. So we have, we use indications for use as part of the way that we define device types. And so if that is a device, if that, that's potentially a dividing line for a device type. Okay, thank you. Next question from Mark, your line is open. Uh, thank you, Mark Redburn here. Uh, quick question, could you clarify the, the, the way that the FDA is going to uh, record or count the devices that are returned to the company rather than left with the patient or the physician? So devices that are returned to the company will not count in the overall five per year, of five units of a given device type per year. So, so if we're building a, a device for a short-term or temporary condition, then that, then it's returned to us that it would not be counted. Is that correct? No. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I think you would have to be more specific about what that specific short-term temporary situation is. The device went and was used by that patient and, and it, and it, for that doctor and it fulfills that need. So that would, would be one use. But if you were making sizing options, so you didn't know exactly the correct size and you would only know that at the time of surgery, so you covered your, your basis with your patient and have a range of sizes that would be available to the doctor to use, then those that are not used for that case and are either destroyed by the physician and they provide you with that statement or are returned to the company would not count in the five units that were distributed that year. Thank you very much. Okay, next question from Bill. Your line is open. Please check your mute button. Bill, your line is open. Yes, hello, this is Phil Gibbs. Um, a, few, a few quick detail questions. Um, as far as the labeling of patient uh, identification and surgeon identification, do you have any guidance on how best to do that? I mean, is it as simple as, you know, such as first initial, last name of the patient or what? Do you have any guidance in that regard? 
we um, we're leaving that a uh, little open to you to decide what's appropriate. We don't want to put anybody in a situation where they would be violating confidentiality rules that other government agencies have about health care and provide us with names that they shouldn't be providing to us. So it, it's um, initials, numbering, dating, however it works for you. Okay. Um. And is uh, the terminology custom-made device acceptable on the label uh, so that it kind of marries up with the European regulations? Um, I can't answer that question. The, the, the person from the Office of Compliance who would be able to answer that isn't here. Um, I, could you um, send us that question to the address on the last slide at DICE and we'll get you an answer? Also, uh, in in the tables, uh, if you could, on table one, in in the summary type table, you've got a couple of columns. One is custom device identification, and the second column is product code. Um, I'm a little confused still on this, uh, you know, the difference between device type and product code. Could you? Talk about that a little bit. What do you want in each of those columns? And are we working off of product code or device type? Because I thought there was a distinct break from product code when I read through this document. So I I would um, I'll let Leslie add anything that she wants to after this. I would say that the device type would be how you are defining the device and how you have categorized it um, according to the definition that's in um, in the regulations and included in this guidance document. Product code is included in the in case that you have modified an existing device and we would like to know which device it was that was modified. Okay, so what, what, type, what type of data are you looking for in the first column? Custom device identification. Is that would a, would device type be appropriate there? So that first column isn't about identifying device type. It's intended to be an identification of the individual custom device. Um, so if you have some sort of identifier of what that device is, uh, um, the concept is that you're identifying each device individually. Okay. I'm just trying to get to, you know, how, how do we how do we differentiate out the five in this in this table, I guess is what I'm trying to drive at. I'm not seeing any I thought I was summarizing or would be summarizing, you know, the quantities of each device type that we did in a year. Okay, next question from Allison. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, you state that in your guidance document that we should maintain records of the evaluation that we use to determine that no other device is domestically available to treat the patient's unique pathology or physiological condition. How does the FDA intend to have a manufacturer provide proof of a patient's unique pathology if that, if that incidence or prevalence is so small that conducting a clinical investigation is considered impractical? We can only provide, you know, research and references to the best of our knowledge. Um, well, just as you said, what you can provide us is fine. Mm -hmm. Let me, I'm going to pass it on to Eric. So the expectation there, as you said, not, there isn't always going to be perfect information on, in every single one of these instances. And our expectation is that you have reasonable information, that you've put a good faith effort into 
into getting all the information that you can in order to make a determination that no other device is domestically available to treat that condition. Um, so we understand that the amount of information that will be available um, for that evaluation will vary. Um, so, so yes, we understand those kinds of situations. It's, it's not like we're going to treat every single situation like everyone is going to be able to get the same information. And also say that this is Aaron that that we recognize you can't you know prove the negative, and the expectation is that the company makes a reasonable good faith effort to ascertain whether or not there's something domestically available for that particular situation, and that you yeah. document what you did to make that determination. Operator, are there any more questions? Showing no further questions. Well, thank you. This is Irene, I hear, and we appreciate your participation and questions today. Please remember that this presentation will be available on the CDRH Learn section of FDA.gov under the heading Specialty Topics. The written transcript and recording will be available on Monday, October 20th. If you have additional questions, please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback on today's presentation. Again, thank you for your participation, and this concludes today's webinar. Okay, thank you. Once again, that does conclude the call for today. You may disconnect your phone lines at this time.